All right. <clears throat> Thank you for staying in your seats for the first part of our doubleheader of a Q&A. Uh, again, we're going to have uh, about a 15, 20-minute Q&A in here, and then we're going to lead anybody that would like to join us to the CIF 46 chat room in the Idea Center Gun Studio, where John Grabowski will moderate an extended conversation for about uh, 45 minutes, and that is free and open to the public. But at this time, please welcome back the director of Believe Land, Andy Billman. Please welcome the moderator of our conversation, local author and baseball historian, Scott Longer. And uh, please welcome the author of The Pitch That Killed, Mike Saul. Well, good afternoon, folks, and uh, welcome here to the theater. We just saw a wonderful presentation of War on the Diamond. I think it's, I just mentioned to Andy that uh, I think it's about the fourth or fifth time I've seen it, and I still get emotional when, uh, when I watch it. It's just that, that powerful. But first up, I wanted to ask Andy, you mentioned earlier, you are a Clevelander. You are a Cleveland baseball fan. You have been for a long, long time, and uh, this is your ball club. But this is something I... I read and had heard that uh, for a long time you and uh, one of the producers, Danielle, had wanted to do something for Ray Chapman. How did this all, how did this all get started? Well, I mean, it really started with this gentleman here and his wonderful book. And also through, is Bobby D still here? Is he here somewhere? I don't know if he is, but if he isn't, Bobby DiBiasio is one of the most wonderful people in the business. And, you know, the, look, we all think, yeah, he deserves a, and he's really good people. So you're asking, like, you know, it all comes together through a book, through people like Bob DiBiasio. It also comes together through memories and just learning and sitting there throughout the years going, I wonder, again, like, being a neutral observer, why do we hate the Yankees so much? And you go through it, and, and when I learned and read the book, I said, well, now we know how it started. It started with a pitch that killed. Um, literally did. And I think throughout time, and if you read Bob Feller's biography, autobiography too. He speaks about how much he hated the Yankees. And you, and you started learning, and we all remember in 07 how much fun it was watching Jabba Chamberlain swat the bugs. Um, what a great moment. I was living in Connecticut. It was even more fun going to work uh, <laughs> that, that next day, uh, buying bug spray for all the good Yankee fans. Um, but truthfully, it comes together through those moments, but there's also a great book by Luke Eplin that was done. There was also a great book by Peter Gombach that was done on the book George. For anybody who wants to learn about the Cleveland George Steinbrenner, read the book George. The first half of that book goes into the Cleveland George, him loving the Indians, growing up as a fan, and wanting, his dream was to buy the Indians. And so when you read these, all these uh, books, and by the way, this gentleman here too wrote some wonderful stories <laughs> and wonderful books. I read them all too. R buy Scott Longer's books. He's a local Clevelander. Um, all these things kind of contribute, and to be truthful, the talents of Daniel Albrico, Art Haran, Pam Sullivan, all these people came together. Then we had the talented Jonah, who's here, who was the Carl Mays. Be kind. Uh, and then we had also Tres Speaker. I forget his first name, but he was here. and He was a wonderful actor. You have all these young actors. All these people kind of came together. It was a, like, it really was a stew. At some time, like, I mean, I directed it, yes, but all these things, I couldn't have done it with all, all these people, including these two gentlemen right here on the stage. Well, I wanted to ask Mike, now, Ray Chapman, of course, we lost him in August of 1920, and then some 60-plus years later, and you're not a native Clevelander, what gave you the impetus or the ideas to write something about Chapman and Mays? Well, uh, thank you, Scott, for that question. Uh, it's a good question because I grew up in Houston. Uh, I don't have any ties to Cleveland, uh, but I am a... a from an early age, I've been a baseball fan and like to read everything I could about baseball. And I remember reading uh, just a, a short little uh, or article about Ray Chapman and his death and being the only player in Major League Baseball history to die from an on-field injury. And that's been almost 150 years now that he still is the only one. And uh, I decided to research it and write it. I thought I was going to write a biography of 
Chapman, but in researching it, I found out that it's really the story of two men, Chapman and Mays. You can't tell the story of, about one of them without telling it about the other. And then, of course, Joe Sewell, who came in and was Ray Chapman reincarnated and who led the Indians to the pennant and went on to, to have the Hall of Fame career that Chapman would have had. And it amazed me that no one had ever written and told this complete story before because it is just a fascinating story. And I do want to thank Andy uh, for doing a good job of telling that. And I do have to admit that in writing this book, it was very emotional and uh, writing <clears throat> the part about, you know, when I got to the, the uh, beaning, that was difficult to write. And I have to admit that I'm not normally an emotional guy, but I did cry while writing that. And uh, seeing it again uh, on the film, you know, the film was very well done, and I still get emotional about that. So I'm just glad, though, that we are able to keep Ray Chapman's memory alive. And uh, we've done so in the book, and now uh, with Andy's film, he's alive on film. So. Anyway, uh, it's a great story, and I hope every, all of you will remember Chappie's name, visit him at the ballpark, and let's uh, kind of keep Chappie alive for us. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, the book is The Pitch That Killed. It is a baseball classic, and if you haven't seen the book, it is still in print, and it's a wonderful read. The other thing that really struck me, it, it's very emotional, the film and the things that go in it, and what really, I think, got to me was the actors in the film portraying the characters. Was that something you thought of initially, Andy, or did that kind of happen as you were working on the project? Well, I want the, I know there's two actors. Can you stand up? Are they still here? Stand up. You should be very proud. There's Carl Mays right there. Don't boo him, folks. <laughs> and Mr. Speaker's here somewhere, too. I don't know where he is. But truthfully, I had actors who were really willing to work with me. And look, um, I like to take credit for this or say like we, we threw salt in their eyes and they started getting emotional, but it really wasn't the case. Uh, we really worked and rehearsed hard. Um, when you're doing an independent film, you don't have a lot of time. So we did two shoot days for all the reenactments. All that was done uh, for the baseball was done in this field in Bristol, Connecticut that it was opened in 1907. So for all the stuff you saw, the pitch that happened with Ray and, um, and with Carl, that actually happened in a real ballpark that Babe Ruth actually played in back in Bristol, Connecticut. And everything else that was done with, um, with Katie and with Ray was done here locally in Cleveland. And we did it at a house here down the road. And we did all of it through the Rockefeller building that was built in 1890. <laughs> so we had them walking down. And um, they were great to work with. And truthfully, Scott, they were great teammates. They really made my job easy. Like, I've done this before. You can work with some real, you know, stubborn people. And they weren't. I mean, seriously, sometimes you're like, just forget it. Just walk and... Let's just go home and hopefully we'll get a shot to kill and forget this. But they were, um, they were not. They were very um, willing to work and um, thankfully it came out so well. And Taylor Hurley's not here. He was the shooter, director of photography. He's a great young uh, photographer out of Detroit. Um, and he really did a nice job too. And I, I, again, she's not here either, but Danielle Albrico and her costumes along with Pam Sullivan, who is here in her costumes. They were, I've done this for a living. Cost, they, these were, I felt like when we walked inside, I was like, holy shit, I think we're in 1920 watching Katie Daly and Ray Chapman. So the credit to them as well, and along with the museum in town who gave us the uniforms. They were great. Team effort. Now, Mike, in, in looking at Chapman and Mays and, and reading about them, to me, it seemed these guys kind of had parallel lives who so were kind of destined to intertwine. I mean, you have... A pitcher who's known for throwing the ball hard, high and inside, he's hit a lot of guys. And you have a batter who likes to bunt and crowd the plate and move around. Did it seem to you that uh, this something might have been inevitable or it wasn't really a surprise what happened at that day? Well, it wasn't a surprise to the uh, Chapman's teammates because uh, Mays did have that reputation and uh, I know Carl Mays is here now. Uh, by the way, you did a great job because uh, Mays' uh, pitching motion was unique. He was the only, he's, he's really the only submarine pitcher in baseball history because when you talk about uh, submarine or sidearm pitchers, they're really, they're throwing sidearm mostly. And Mays 
as it was mentioned in the film, he was throwing where it looked like his knuckles would uh, scrape the ground. And so the ball was coming up, and Chapman, we don't know how Chapman or what Chapman was thinking because he, you know, he didn't survive this to tell us what was going on. But a, another Cleveland ball player in 1911, a guy named Terry Turner, described when he was hit by a pitch similar to what happened to Chapman. And he said the ball was coming at him. He could see it. He knew it was going to hit him but he was transfixed. It was as if he was paralyzed by it. He said, he described it as being similar to, you see a snake, it's coiled and about to strike. You know it's going to bite you, but you're so fascinated by it that you just can't move. All you can do is watch it. And I have a, a hunch that that's probably what happened on the pitch that came toward Chapman. And one of the ironies about this was the day that Chapman got hit, hit was, the, the day that this uh, book, uh, it was a baseball instructional book written by one of the sports writers of that day, it came out and he described, you know, he's giving pointers on how to play baseball and the player he chose to describe as having the ideal stance at the plate so that he wouldn't be hit by a pitch was Ray Chapman. And because Chapman ordinarily was not hit by pitches and so on this one time, you know, people have speculated it was because of the weather, that he couldn't see the ball. But Terry Turner believed Chapman probably saw it, but he had a similar reaction to it, and he was just frozen for some reason. It's just, a, just an incredible event. It still resonates. This is 2022. This happened back in 1920, but it's still very much relevant in, in our thoughts about Cleveland and our team and, and what we do. Andy, I wanted to ask, there was numerous people that contributed to the film, all the people you interviewed. How were you able to put together like a large group of people all around the country and get them to talk about what happened there and the rivalry? How were you able to like, make that all mesh together? Well, there's uh, two big things, coffee and liquor. <laughs> so you drink a lot of coffee throughout the day. I would sit and read, and I have a very patient fiance, Christine, who's there in her, there in her crown, Christy. And she, uh, she, would, she would make sure my light was on late at night so I'd keep reading, <laughs> keep watching. That really helped a lot. But truthfully, the biggest thing I really wanted to do, which I hope comes out in the film, is having people who could really relate. Um, Luke Applin wrote a wonderful book. You wrote several great books. You wrote a great book called The Pitch That Killed. And the idea is like have the strongest people who wrote these events talk about them and come to life on camera. And so that was my biggest chore here. I do believe in doing a lot more interviews than maybe some documentarians do. I do that because I think it gives the best voices and the best bites. Um, with that said, though, there's a lot of reading, there's a lot of listening, and there's a lot of time. He's not here. Paul Carruthers, who I can see Christy laughing, would sit there and go, why the fuck did you interview <laughs> all these people? And how are you expecting me to get them all in the film? And there would be that discussion daily. But we got through it, and by the end he goes, you were right. <laughs> and... and I hope it plays on the films. I do believe having strengths and people who know these topics come out makes for the best film and best bites. Excellent. And I wanted to ask Mike, it was an incredible tragedy that happened on that day, but it continued, really. I mean, we don't talk a lot or I think know a tremendous amount about Katie Chapman, but what she went through in, in the years after after this tragedy it must have been absolutely awful for her and then she wasn't alive then but the family the chapmans and the dailies lost their granddaughter as well over a period of roughly about eight years it's just something that uh, it's really hard to fathom well it, it truly was a tremendous or a great tragedy and um katie chat or katie daily chapman's brother dan daly was still living when I researched the book in the 1980s, and uh, Dan, to, Dan happened to, to as a 16-year-old, he was given permission to travel with the Indians to New York. So he was there when the uh, Beaning and, and uh, Chappie's death happened. So he witnessed all of that, and uh, he talked about that, and it, it did seem like that family was jinxed because basically, uh, Ray and, and uh, Kathleen had bought a house in Cleveland, 
and it was a, a large house at that time, so he had a lot of room, and Ray's teammates always kidded him about, what are you going to do with all those rooms in the house? And Ray said, we're going to fill them up. And so he had planned on having a big family, a lot of children, and had he lived, I'm sure that's what would have happened. It's also true that uh, Chapman came from a family that was very long-lived. His sister, Margaret Chapman, who uh, was uh, in the film, Margaret Joy, she uh, lived to be 106 years old, and she said that all of the Chapmans lived a long time. Uh, her parents, uh, you know, even the men in the family would live into their 90s. So this really cut down someone in, uh, way before his time. So. Um, again, you know, for, for me, you know, Ray Chapman, it's very emotional seeing him. I wanted to put in a word of, uh, about Joe Sewell also, because the man who took over for Chapman, uh, first of all, I think I'm related to him. My last name's Sal and Sewell. They're, they're both, they come from a Scottish name, and according to Joe Sewell's daughter, uh, the spelling of the name evolved over the years, so we're probably related and uh, Joe Sewell's is a, is a big part of the story also, as you could see at the end of uh, the film. And he was a great person. I was lucky enough to meet him. And ironically, later, Joe Sewell became a scout for the Indians. And Carl Mays at one time scouted for the Indians. And uh, on one occasion, when they were scouting for different teams, they met. And Sewell and, and uh, Mays, uh, talked and, and they, they even talked about the Chapman incident and Sewell actually said he liked Carl Mays and I know the Mays family was not particularly happy with uh, with my book and I know that uh, you know it's kind of awkward uh, I went to the showing of this film in Newport Beach where Pam Sullivan lives and the uh, Mays family, some, his granddaughter and uh, some, a couple of other members of the family were living in San Diego and, and they actually came up for the viewing and we talked and, you know, it's still kind of an awkward relationship because they hold this book as, you know, Carl Mays was really a nice man and I did meet someone after the book came out who had played on a youth team for Mays and he talked about, you know, Mays was wonderful to us. You made a big impact in our lives and helped a lot of people. But it is true that Mays was a tough man. A, a member of the Yankees front office, when Mays was on the team, uh, a member of the Yankees described him as he somehow had the ability to offend anyone within range of his voice. <laughs> and it's kind of hard to argue about. He was really a nice guy when you see this film and he's bragging about grabbing Smokey Joe Wood by the hair and pounding his head into the back of a seat until blood is flying everywhere. So uh, he was really a complicated man, was a great pitcher, and, and as his record will attest. Okay, thank you, Mike. I want to thank Andy and Mike for a terrific presentation. I hope you all had a great afternoon. Thank you. All right, and remember, this is a double header and there's gonna be a longer conversation. You'll be able to ask questions at the Idea Center Gun Studio. We have a volunteer with a follow me sign. You just need to find that volunteer in the lobby and we'll lead right over there. And we're asking you not to ask our filmmakers questions here until we get over there because we wanna start that program soon. So thank you so much for joining us and join us for the second half, the second game of the double header. All right, thank you.